you show the dog has plenty of tricks he ain't. Come on, my fine lads. Back to the garden wall we have. We have work to do. Another day of heartbreaking sight work ahead. No choice but to continue the harvest. Load the cart. Causing the fly to squeak in surprise, the arch filled with flickering energies. A fleshy mound spilled from the portal, something large and slug like. The very deprived Rygos drew his blade from his stomach. It shone brightly, even in the gathering darkness. Bar the gates, he said. It took Gosma a moment to notice that he was clutching the rim of a barrel. None can hide from me. Every soul is mine, my light. Merrick hated to see his strong, courageous mind laid so low. It was already complete. Nagash had already won. Like a living shadow, Cricktail of Clan Slink led his clique of gutter runners and assassins from Archway to Colonnade to Mausoleum on his way through Nagashasar. His clique was one of hundreds, but with the certainty of a born winner, he knew he had penetrated the furthest into the cursed city of Nagash. His kill pack picked their way through catacombs and cloisters, sliding from one monolithic obelisk to another, sneaking past towering statues of the legendary Mortarks and building sized death's heads. Darting in the shadows of lumbering undead gargants they went, flitting as half-shadows between stationary legions of bone things, then climbing up the skull-studded pillars to run soundlessly across slanting roofs. The slink adepts had learned of what the grey seer Rechnik had intended, and through him learned the schemes of the Master Clan. There was undoubtedly something at the heart of the obsidian black pyramid hovering inverted above the city, a prize that could ensure the ascendance of the Clan Eshin forevermore. According to their shadow master back in Ulgu, the stakes were higher than ever. On they went through the undead city, using every artifice of the form of smoke and shade to its full extent. Even Nagash's watchful Morgast sentinels were little match for Clan Slink's finest, with their uncanny abilities bolstered by rites of concealment and illusion. At times they were no more substantial than sighs of cold air on the breeze. They slid ever onwards towards the Black Pyramid at the Necropolis's heart. In there was the quintessence of power, and they would claim it, no matter the cost. Atop the highest of Nagashizar's pyramids, save one, Arkan the Black stared upon his works with a feeling of cold satisfaction. How long had it been since Nagash had tasked him with creating the masterwork that now blotted out the light of Heish with its vastness? How many of the restless dead had marched to his slavish beat over the millennia? Come to that, how many warriors of how many races had given their lives to stop it? The screams and battle cries of their armies, even now carrying upon the wind. It mattered little. In the final reckoning, let Manfred have his sport, setting one enemy against another as he sprung the long-honed defences of Nakishizar upon those who sought to challenge the master. Let Neferata rejoice in the culmination of her centuries-long schemes, strife upon strife, ensuring that no force of the Pantheon of Order could truly call another a trusted ally. All called Nagash's nemesis would be arriving piecemeal, or not at all. All that mattered was the great work, and it was a few trickling sand grains away from completion. With a thrilling sense of grandeur, Arkan looked out upon the myriad tombs, monuments, and statues of Nagashizar. He intoned a phrase of power in ancient Nekarian, and summoned the host of departed spirits that would carry the capstone of his final achievement, his greatest achievement. 
Nagash's greatest achievement, he corrected himself, to its final resting place, and in doing so, damn the mortal realms forever. Soon, so soon it would be over. The great black pyramid would thrum with power, and the necroquake unfold. Nagash and his faithful servants would watch as the spirits of all ages rose from their graves to slay the living, then drink in the power that was rightfully theirs in the aftermath. The souls of the dead would all find their way to Nagashizar, starving the other gods of worship, and in doing so, laying them low. It was a plan so beautiful in its ambition, its completeness, that Arkan felt moved for the first time in eons. If he had still been a mortal man, and if he had still been capable, he would have wept. Ignoring the sounds of battle around the citadel's lower levels, Lord Ordinator Aros Divadat put his eye to the arcanoscope of his citadel's observatorium. Pushing the sounds of screaming and the clashing of swords out of his mind, he consulted the complex array and scrying mortar and pestle arrangement on his desk, tweaked a silver strand of wire on the Shishan section of his star chart, and leaned in close. Within the brimming mortar upon his desk, a solution of ground celestium and powdered glimmerings revealed a scene of marching armies converging upon a city of midnight black monuments. It was a sight that filled him with mounting dread. Weeks ago, his trusted friend and confidant, Voris Starstrike, had given to his own vendetta instead of leading the march upon Nagashizar. In waging war against the Cornate armies of Marakar Bloodsky, he had destroyed any chance the two forces had of reaching Nagashizar intact and shattering the works of the great necromancer. Without coherence, without unity, the vitality, talent, and spark of the races of the living would be stymied, and ultimately come to nothing. Even now they were held at bay by the serried legions of the dead, who, by contrast, were united under a single indomitable will. And they would pay with their lives. Lord Arius sighed, the weight of a dozen deaths heavy upon him. He strode towards the stairs. He must return to Azir, for the Sacrosact Chamber would be mustering for new war, and his brotherhood had need of him. The sound of armoured feet came from the citadel's spiral staircase as horned, plate-clad killers raced up the stairs. He took up his astral hammers and ran to meet them, knowing full well he went to his death. A robed figure drifted over the cold Chaishan dunes towards the crystal gates, his many mouths muttering in a dozen different languages at once. Bangles chimed on his four slender arms, and motes of light like collapsing constellations glimmered under his voluminous hood. He had led many key players in a secret dance, manipulating their actions to music only he could hear. With the other unwitting participants sliding into place at the last, his master would be pleased with the chorus of anarchy that resulted. The demon shapeshifter could feel the energy of potential futures crackling in the air. The greatest change to befall the mortal realm since the coming of the great game was mere moments away. Soon, those energies that mortals sought to tame, and gods too come to that, would be unleashed, never to be truly controlled again. The Death Runner Spark Eye gave the signal, and as one, the clan slinks gave and held to their breath. The cool air of Nagashisar above them was filled with a gale of spirit hosts, swirling around the purple-black monoliths that formed the outer skin of the Great Pyramid. The time was nigh. As the shadow of the final obelisk slid over the slink adepts, Spark Eye shut his eyes. His fellows did the same. In a single instant, he and his shrouded killers shade stepped from the city into the sky, skitter leaping to cling to the underside of the giant black monolith, casting gloom on the city below. The huge construction, still rising, led them within twenty feet of an aperture in the pyramid's side. They leapt one after another through the gap. Glidsnick didn't quite make it, his claws scrabbling on the glassy underside of the inverted pyramid before he was snatched away like a ragdoll by the gales of power that raged around it. Sparkeye smirked as he climbed up the great black pyramid and into the gloom beyond. There was a reason he had put Glidsnick to the rear. He had never really liked the backstabbing little sneak anyway. Nagash felt the fires of anticipation in his chest, once cold and barely smouldering, they now roared like a furnace. 
The last time he had felt this way was when he had condemned the lands of his birth to a hideous demise by plague, followed by an eternity of undeath. What a glorious time that had been. Even if it was a world away, it still gave him satisfaction to think of it. Now a new order was imminent, with Nagash at its very heart. The prophecies had been unfortunate. Many a mortal, deludedly thinking itself more than a mere puppet, had striven to disrupt his plans. Even the gods had united against him. Some had succeeded, but they had failed at the last. He had kept corn occupied with the red mist in Ashqui, releasing the anger of a hundred slain death gods through the abyssal fires. Teclis, for all their talk of enlightenment and illumination, kept to their own borders and their obsession with Slanesh, little realizing this had doomed them as much as any overcommitment. Through Arkan and his black disciples, Nagash had set Marathi and Slanesh against each other. By invading Elgu's thirteen kingdoms, he had given the Shadow Queen all the reason she needed to muster armies to fight his pawns, and secretly use them, and secretly use them to defy the followers of her ancient foe. Zeech had largely stayed out of his way after Nagash's agents, Neferata foremost among them, had engineered the sacrifice of the prophets and soothsayers across the realms. Soon after, he had released the ghost of the dead moon Morisleb from its bondage to feast on the secrets of men in the form of Lunagast. The architect of fate had been kept busy ever since. And all the while, that fat fool Nurgle was busy trying to redefine the realms themselves, preoccupied with bringing riotous life to lands whose very nature rejected it. Nagash had only been too happy to indulge the Plague Father's obsessions, ceding lands that he could do without whilst the true battle was fought elsewhere. Gorkamorka had moved against him with surprising speed and efficiency, so much so that Nagash was unsure the greenskin god did not have a shadowy sponsor working behind him. He had been forced to summon the Black Void of Shaish to steal more time, expending a great deal of gravesand to ensure he had knights enough to complete his great work. It was a risk, but one well taken, and it had paid off. Sigmar the Soul Thief had sent his legions, hurled his meteors in a fit, but was too concerned with consolidating his gains against Chaos to see the danger growing under his nose. He called himself the God King now, but it was plain to see that he still thought as a warrior, with all the limitations that that brought. No amount of hammers and blades could fight against the energies of the cosmos. As for the horned rat, he was too weak to... Nagash felt a ripple in the ether, a breath of unpredictability in the wind. As for the horned rat, a niggling claw of doubt scratched inside his skull, but by then it was too late. Spark Eye backflipped like an acrobat, narrowly avoiding being decapitated as a giant white with glowing green eyes barreled around the corner. The undead revenant's black-bladed axe carved across the corridor in a blur of dark energy. A shadow smoke bomb was already leaving the Death Runner's hand as his image split in two, his doppelganger keeping the massive horned skeleton busy as he slid under the sweep of its double-headed axe. The warrior filled with oglu smoke, and Spark Eye's little band of rats slunk past to dart further into the black-walled pyramid. There were only three of his fellow assassins left now, the rest having fallen to curse traps or the undead denizens that prowled this labyrinthian maze of arcane passageways and crawl spaces. Fewer to claim the wealth, Sparkai told himself, fewer to steal the glory that was rightfully his, but in his soul he knew this was pure bravado. The musk of fear was heavy in the air, for the inside of the pyramid did not seem to conform to the laws of the cosmos. All four of the Slink Adepts knew they were hopelessly, irrevocably, lost. Spark Eye saw something that lit a flicker of hope in his breast. A chamber ahead glowed with a lambent purple energy, illuminating strangely angled walls inscribed with line upon line of tiny runes and, and pictograms. Some of the eldritch diagrams glowed brighter than others, glimmers of particularly pure black realmstone crystals marking the vital points. The Death Runner's eyes lit up with avarice. He suppressed a shudder, putting it down to the excitement of triumph as he ran his claws across one of the walls. He motioned his fellows forward and pulled out a three-bladed triskly, 
and began to dig a gem-like crystal out of the wall. He put his shoulder to it, and out it came with a pop. The pyramid shuddered, just enough to vibrate Spark Eye's whiskers and make his musk gland tighten up unpleasantly. Probably nothing, he thought, taking his friskily to the next jewel. Born by the spirits of dead kings, the final stone of the Black Pyramid slid into place with a soft click. The sound was the death of a thousand nations. Slowly, impossibly, the Great Black Pyramid began to turn. The gales of spectres that swirled around it turned into a vortex, spinning as hurricanes of Shaishan energy were sucked in to converge upon the megastructure's tip. The inverted pyramid revolved faster and faster, as gales of eldritch power were absorbed by its vitrified gravesand. Its stolen energies pulsed as it had accelerated to whipping, blurring speed. As Nagish's R and the lands around it were drained of colour, the nexus of Shaishan magic reached a critical point. In a single instant, the soul of every living creature for hundreds of leagues was wrenched free from its body. Rapidly desiccating flesh was blasted to dust, and a chorus of agonised screams echoed across the bleached wasteland. As the Great Black Pyramid became impossibly dense with magical energy, it began to sink into the heart of the realm, not so much drilling into it as buckling, stretching, drawing the lands down around it. The pit beneath it became a sinkhole, an abyss, a hungering whirlpool of energy that gathered in everything around it and drew it ever downwards. With a thunderous boom like the cracking of worlds, the energies of Shaish imploded, and from there spread out across the mortal realms in a horrible shrieking tide. The bow waves of energy that crashed across each realm brought with it a strange and anarchic disruption of the aether, for, at the last, Nagash's great ritual had been tainted by the agents of chaos. Everywhere, the spirits of the dead rose from their graves. Twisted geists of all descriptions burst from the mortal clay they had once inhabited, as one domain after another was assailed by a billion dead souls. Then, as the metaphysical backlash cascaded across the cosmos, the energies of the cataclysm went wild. Laughter rang out into the darkness, maddening and without end. The Shaiish necroquake had come, and the mortal realms were changed forever. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to the Malign Portents. This has been a giant journey through the mortal realms for me, and I hope it has been for you. With a Malign Portents now come to an end, I hope that you out there have taken as much joy in this as I have. I hope that you've enjoyed the Fluff and Hammer, and I hope that you would like to have copies of these in mp3 from the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash fluffenhammer. I thank you all. Good night. And now ends the malign portents.